All right, welcome to our scene on Treponema pallidum and syphilis. In this scene, we see over here the tripod mom. We can see that she has three legs over here. She's a tripod and she's a mom. Or we can call her an ima, as ima means mom in Hebrew. So she's the tripod ima. Tripod ima for treponema. And we see in this scene over here that she is holding these cups over here. These cups are locked shut. She bought new sippy cups from the store and locked them up to play a trick on her kids. So we'll call these the sipless cups. Or just sipless. Sipless for syphilis. This is going to remind us that treponema pallidum is responsible for syphilis disease. Now, before we talk about acquired and congenital syphilis, let's take a look at this mother for another moment. We see that it says on her body, or whatever you call it over here, obligate parasite. And this is just to ingrain in our minds that Treponema pallidum is an obligate parasite. It requires the human host in order to survive. More importantly, we take a look at her neck over here, and we see that it is spiral shaped. This spiral shape shows up in our scenes on spirochetes, as Treponema pallidum is one of the spirochetes. Spirochetes are long and thin and contain endoflagella, which gives them motility. We also note that it's red. Now, I made it red just because Treponema pallidum is technically gram-negative, but since its envelope is too thin to visualize under light microscopy, it's not always categorized as a gram-negative bacteria. Okay, now let's talk about acquired and congenital syphilis. So this side of the room over here is going to remind us of acquired syphilis, and we're going to spend most of our time talking about this. Acquired syphilis can be transmitted sexually, or through breaks in the skin, or even during a blood transfusion. Congenital syphilis, on the other hand, can be acquired through the placenta, or even while a baby is being passed through the vagina during delivery. Let's begin with acquired syphilis. So again, these three kids over here are very angry, and that's because of the trick that the mother over here, or the ima over here, is playing on them, that she locked their sippy cups shut. So they're very angry. These three kids over here, one, two, and three, are going to remind us of primary, secondary, and tertiary syphilis, respectively. Let's begin with primary syphilis. Here we have this boy over here, representing primary syphilis. During primary syphilis, the spirochetes destroy the soft tissue and skin where they enter the body, and that results in the formation of ulcers called shankers, or syphilitic shankers. And that's represented by this chain over here with the car around it, around his high chair. Again, chain car for shanker. And as you can see on this car over here, they are painless. Shankers are painless. And in fact, if we take a look at the hood over here, we can see a real picture of what a shanker looks like. These shankers have a hard base, raised borders, and are usually covered by a fluid rich in spirochetes. These spirochetes can spread to other parts of the body as well as to other individuals. In individuals who acquire syphilis through sexual contact, the primary shanker develops around the external genitalia. Actually, if syphilis is acquired through something like a blood transfusion, there may not be any primary shanker, or even any localized stage of the disease at all. But anyway, after primary syphilis comes secondary syphilis. Here we have brother number two representing secondary syphilis. Secondary syphilis is known as the dissemination stage, and it occurs about 6 to 12 weeks after the initial infection. And in this stage, spirochetes enter the bloodstream, also known as spirochetemia, and this causes generalized lymphadenopathy, which is when the spirochetes can be found in the lymph nodes throughout the body. And that's why if you take a look over here, we see that this boy over here has this cute lymph node as a pet. This large lymph node reminds us of the lymphadenopathy. If we take a look at the boy's chest over here, we notice that he has this rash on his chest. When the spirochetes attach and infect endothelial cells in small capillaries near the skin, it causes a non-itchy maculopapular rash, which are small bumps that are either flat or raised. And the reason why these arrows over here are going outward is to remind us that it begins with the trunk and then goes outwards, towards the arms and legs, and even towards the palms and the soles. In front of the boy over here is this candy latte. It's like a latte with candy in it. Candy latte for condylomalata, which are smooth, white, painless, wart-like lesions and appear on moist areas like the genitals. They may also appear around the anal region or around the armpits. And one more thing that we notice over here is that this lymph node over here, which we mentioned before, is actually losing his hair, which reminds us of the patchy hair loss that may be seen in secondary syphilis. Okay, we're about to move on to tertiary syphilis, but before we get to that, we notice something in between sun number two and sun number three. 
On the ground, it says latent syphilis. After secondary syphilis, there's actually a stage called the latent phase or latent syphilis. And this is when the disease enters a dormant or asymptomatic phase. Although there will be positive serology, there will be no symptoms. There's actually early latent syphilis and late latent syphilis, but since this is not so high yield, we're not going to discuss it. Let's move on to tertiary syphilis. So here we have sun number three representing tertiary syphilis. In tertiary syphilis, there's an immune response led by T-cells. Without getting too complicated, in some cases the immune cells start to huddle around and form a granulomatous lesion called a gumma. And that's why this third brother over here, as opposed to the other two, is chewing gum, to remind us of the gummas. The tissue at the center of the gumma can actually end up without any oxygen and lead to a coagulative necrosis. Now in tertiary syphilis, there can be lots of organ damage. Let's begin with cardiovascular syphilis. In front of this sun over here, there is this vase with the VV on it. This reminds us of the vase of azorum. That is, in cardiovascular syphilis, there's an endoarteritis, which is inflammation of tiny arterioles, which are the vase of azorum. And these supply blood to large arteries like the aorta, which is why there may be an aortitis, or inflammation of the aorta, which is why in this vase over here, we see the aorta over here has some fire on it. Again, which reminds us of the aortitis, which can lead to aortic aneurysms. In neurosyphilis, the spirochetes occupy the back part of the spinal cord, and this can result in something called Tabes dorsalis, represented by this table tennis racket over here. Table tennis racket for Tabes dorsalis. And if we take a look at this tennis racket over here, we notice that the posterior part is shaded, which reminds us of the wasting or loss of the back of the spinal cord. This leads to loss of vibratory sense and loss of proprioception. Sometimes the spirochetes can invade the capillaries supplying the anterior part of the spinal cord resulting in a general paresis or even paralysis. But anyway, in cases of sensory ataxia, there will be Charcot joints, in which there's joint damage due to neurodegeneration, as well as a Romberg sign, in which there's an inability to maintain balance with one's eyes closed. On top of his head over here, we notice the gargoyle, and his gargoyle does not notice the light directly in front of his eyes, which reminds us of the argyle Robinson pupil, which is when the pupil loses its light reflex, but it still actually does have its accommodation reflex, meaning that the pupil still constricts when there's a nearby object. Before we talk about diagnosis, let's talk about congenital syphilis. So on this side of the room, there is this random baby over here. I know, he doesn't really look like the other brothers, but let's take a look at this baby. We notice several things about this baby, which remind us of the symptoms of congenital syphilis. Symptoms include snuffles, which is when the nose is blocked by increased secretions, which contain spirochetes. And we can see that over here by this poor baby's nose. Babies may also present with linear scars at the angle of the mouth, which we can see over here, as well as Hutchinson teeth which is when the teeth are notched. We also note that he has a, what is described as a saddle nose, which is a bony destruction of the nose. We also note that he has ear damage, or cranial nerve 8 deafness, which occurs usually in late disease, that is, after the infant is two years old. And finally, if we take a look at his shins over here, we notice that his tibia is bent, which reminds us of the saber shins, or when the tibia are bent. This occurs in congenital syphilis. Now let's talk about diagnosis, and we have to talk about acquired syphilis and congenital syphilis separately. For acquired syphilis, we're going to take a look behind this closet over here, where we can see several things. Well, first of all, it randomly says direct testing with DFM and PSR, which reminds us that direct testing of syphilis is with direct field microscopy as well as PCR. But let's talk about the serologic testing. Over here we see this random video camera over here. This video camera on top of a roll, perhaps a roll of toilet paper. So the video roll, video roll for VDRL. The VDRL is a non-specific test of treponema pallidum. And let's take a closer look at this video camera for a minute. We see the wrapper in here. Wrapper for RPR. RPR is also a non-specific test of syphilis. So if we go further down, you notice this guy over here who is dancing. I'm not sure if this is a, an actual guy or just a toy. And it says specifically fat abs. Total pa. Fat abs, as this guy over here has fat abs, reminds us of the FTA abs, or the FTA ABS test, which is a specific test for treponema, and total PA for TPPA. Again, this is another specific test of treponema pallidum. And they wrote on the wall over here, just to remind us that for neurosyphilis, we test the spinal fluid with VDRL, FTA ABS, and PCR. For congenital syphilis, we require looking at both the mother and the fetus's serologic levels and compare them. But let's focus on treatment now. On both sides of the scene over here, we see these pencils going through the wall. Pencil reminds us of penicillin, as treatment for syphilis is with penicillin. In acquired syphilis, we give penicillin, and in congenital syphilis, if we are concerned about the baby, we give the mother penicillin. Now let's take a look outside over here. 
Under the pencil, we see this jar. This reminds us of the Jarge-Hersheimer reaction. When using penicillin for syphilis, it is important to look out for this reaction. This is when spirochetes die and break open, releasing lots of antigens all at once and making the immune system go haywire. The thermometer inside this jar reminds us of the sudden fever seen in this condition. Sweating, as well as muscle and joints pain may also be seen. The moon over here reminds us of this intense immune response. Phew, that was a lot. I hope you enjoyed the scene on trepanema pallidum and syphilis. Take care.